Thanks. Okay, so last time we were looking at uh, this sort of key computation step of backdrop. We were trying to derive two specific gradients. We did that for multi layer networks. And we were looking at convolutional neural networks. We had understood what a convolution is. And today, Harsh is going to tell us a lot about you know, these two networks, for example. Actually, I don't know if that's Alex or not. But it's, you know, it's, it's similar to these sort of architectures where the first few layers are convolutions. Uh, followed by some pooling, which causes the image to become smaller and smaller. Ultimately, it was a good enough. Yes, question. Um, but today, what I want to do is I want to actually just derive, given a convolutional layer. So we know how to do this, right? We know how to write fully connected layers. We know how to do backdrop in that. We've derived that in class. What I want to do is just tell you once you do a convolution, how do you write down those parameters and how do you do backdrop? So, uh, how do you do backward pass with respect to a convolution layers? The backward pass with respect to max pooling or subsampling layers is going to be simple, so we'll skip that and we'll come back to the classes. Okay, so let's, let's do this. So we remember the general notation, which is um, in multi-layer perceptrons, we started drawing them finally in the third dimension. The, a particular layer in a multi-layer perceptron had C1 neurons as input, C2 neurons as output, um, and if this is the JF neuron, it's connected by all others, and the weight on if this is the ith neuron, we said this was WJI, and we said H, um, so the output here is hidden response of the nth layer J neuron, and the input coming here is hidden response L minus one to the neuron. And we had written HL, so this guy, what is the output? It's just summation over all. Did I swap those two? That used to be my notation. Yes, I swapped those two. So this was the I. J equals one through C one W I J times H J. Okay. So in a multi-layer perceptron, this was just a scalar product summation. We said when you go to a convolutional neural network, every single neuron here becomes sort of a two D matrix, right? It's we wrote this down as height comma width or something, and this went in the third dimension. So every single neuron was a height comma width. Uh, matrix in the third dimension, there's C minus, there's C1 inputs of them, and there's C2 outputs. Right. This is the ith output neuron, so this is H, L of I, it's now a matrix of size, height, comma, width, and we also talked about last time that the input size and the output size, this could be related depending on whether you're doing stride one convolution and whether you're doing padding or not, and things. Okay, we wrote down H I of L is summation of J is one to C one of uh, H L of J convolved with W I J. So every edge here, this is the ith. This is the J neuron, this is the I neuron. Every edge here is now no longer a scalar, it's also a matrix of size K1 by K2. It's an actual filter. You do a 2D convolution, that's what gives you that. And if you look at just the ith filter and you look at all edges coming into that, this is the K1 by K2 by C1 sort of a 3D cube. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so that was that. Um, what, I'm going to, what, I, what we're trying to do today is, these are the parameters. I'd like to, the input coming into this is the gradient with respect to, so, input coming in is gradient with respect to each one of these feature maps. And we'd like to compute the gradient with respect to these weights and the gradient with respect to the input feature maps. So let's, let's do one thing, let's make our life simple. There's going to be a whole bunch of notational mess in this, and there are going to be a bunch of summations. 
So I'll, yes. Just a random question. Should that be C2 for the K2 1 by K2? No, it should be C1 because it's, this summation is over C1. So each filter here does a convolution, right? So there's C1 of these slices. I mean, uh, there's C1 of, there's C2 of these volumes. Each volume has C1 slices. Okay, so because there's going to be a whole bunch of summations anyway, um, I'm going to make my life simple, and I'm going to assume that C1 is equal to 1 and C2 is equal to 1, right, for simplicity. This is just a summation, it won't really change sort of gradient descent or any sort of things. We'll assume, and you know, I'll try to make sure my notation is cleaner, so I don't want to do any subscripts, superscripts. So I'll assume, you know, here's a simple, so there's one matrix that comes in X, there is one filter W, so the matrix is of size N1 by N2. There is one filter W, which is of size K1 by K2. And there is one output Y. And I want to use Y because if I start using H sub L, H sub L minus 1, there's going to be a bunch of notations anyway. So let me just keep it simple. So the output is Y, which let's assume you've done the padding and everything is also N1 by N2. So there's, there's just one parameter here. In the backward pass, uh, y, so the, in the forward pass, y is of size n1 by m2, and the gradients with respect to y are also of the same size. Right? This is something that we talked about. If you're producing some outputs, each one of them has some effect on the final outcome. And so you get back a, a map of the same size. Okay. And so what we'd like to produce is the derivative of loss with respect to w and the derivative of loss with respect to x. This is given to us, this is what we'd like to produce. So far, so good? Okay. And the key sort of, what we know about this process what we know about this process is this sort of magical expression, right? Um, oh, by the way, just to uh, just to uh, tell you my notation, I'm going to use, uh, so a pixel here, so I'm going to use row comma column, so this is going to be R, this is going to be C, and I'm going to use A to sum over this and B to sum over this. That makes sense. So A, B's are going from 0 to K minus 1, K2 minus 1, and R, C are going 0 to N1 minus 1, N2 minus 1. So here's the, here's the expression that we're working with, and this is what produces output y of r comma c, if you want to know what the output of this row comma column value is, you take your filter, you put it at that row comma column value, and then you take, you sort of take a dot product between this matrix and that crop of the input. Okay. And you're this down as a equals 0 to k1 minus 1, k equals 0 to k2 minus 1 of x of r plus k. That makes sense? Okay, that's just, we've written column convolution that way. Right? Okay. Um, one thing that you should think about is, is another way of thinking about this double summation is that it's a dot product. So take your filter, which is a K1 by K2 filter, and just string it up into a long vector. Right? So let me call this w red or something, and let me call this x. Right, so you sort of, for every filter placement, you have cropped out an image, and you have strung it up into a long uh, vector, and you have strung the weight vector into a long thing, and this is the inner product, and that gives you the value at this, at this r comma c, and that's why you had cropped the input. Does that make sense? In fact, it may seem extremely counterintuitive to think of so, but convolutions in most matrix, in most uh, standard libraries, are actually implemented as a bunch of dot products. So the way they're actually implemented is that you go over all the stride locations, you copy out the image into a matrix, put it into the columns, and you copy out the filters, put it into the rows, and then you do a matrix multiplication of those two. Right? It seems extremely wasteful, especially because you're copying, if it's stride one, you copy out this 
block, you, you copy out another block, you copy out another block, and you're putting this into an extremely large matrix, and you're losing a lot of memory. But it turns out that the way some of the matrix multiplication algorithms are already implemented and extremely well engineered on GPUs, that's one of the fastest ways of doing convolutions. So this is called matrix unrolling, that's how convolutions are actually implemented. Make sense? Okay. So, let me try to get to, uh, so I'll do one of the terms. So, notice that we're trying to compute these two terms, derivative of loss with respect to x, derivative of loss with respect to w. And what we're given is derivative of loss with respect to y, but this is a, a matrix, right? So I can index this as r, c. Derivative of loss with respect to this particular pixel r, c. Okay. So what I will do is just compute this term today, and I'll tell you that the derivative with respect to x is similar in real numbers. Okay. So let's let's try to compute in particular this quantity. Derivative of L with respect to A prime comma B prime. Okay. This is a filter. There's a pixel here, which I'm referring to as A prime comma B prime. And I'd like to know that as you change that filter pixel, what happens to the ultimate loss function? Right? That's what I'm trying to find out. And once you stare at this expression, the way to think about chain rule, right? Changing this pixel, changing this failed filter value, what does it change in terms of the output mask? And what, how does that output mask, output map change the ultimate loss function? Right? That's vanilla chain rule. And here you have to realize that this particular pixel plays a role in the output computation of every single output neuron, if you will, right? It's a convolution, you've got to put it everywhere, and whatever this number was, if I set it to plus infinity, for example, everything here becomes any ends and infinities, right? So, here's how, you know, it, it, because it depends on everything, I have to sum over everything. So, r equals 0 to n1 minus 1, c equals 0 to n2 minus 1, this is me summing over all output pixels. The derivative of loss with respect to y of r comma c times y of r comma c with respect to the b of k prime. Aren't you happy there are no superscripts, subscripts, and edges overloaded? So this is basically saying that as I twiddle this one particular pixel of A prime comma B prime, it makes an effect on this particular output. There is a particular neuron here that it's, that it's affecting. And that ultimately has an effect on the loss function, and you're basically summing up over all such. Okay, so this is given to us. This is just input coming in in the backward pass. We just have to compute this particular thing. That's the expression. You could either mathematically try to write down, if some of you are good with notation, you can tell me exactly what that is. Anybody know what that is? So what should be derivative of y, r, c with respect to w, a prime, b prime? Uh, x of r plus a dash by c plus b dash. Yes. Uh, so that's if you just plug through the math, you look for this particular term in here, you look at its coefficient, you just copy that. Another way of thinking about it is we're trying to say, how does this particular output change when I change this number, right? But the way to think about it is this particular thing, just find its corresponding r comma c here. The way that's computed is you take a window k1 by k2, you place this mask here, and then you just do a dot product, right? So this pixel, a prime b prime is sitting here. It pulls out R C plus A prime B prime. Right? And that's those two multiply together to form its contribution here. And so this thing is just X of R plus B prime C plus B prime. That makes sense? You can either do it do it analytically, that there's a double summation here. I'm only taking the derivative with respect to this number, so its coefficient must come out. Or you can try to think of this visually. I'm trying to know how does this number change as I change this number. Well, that number is computed by a dot product here, and so its, it's coefficient has to go up. 
Okay, so almost there. Does that look like something? Does that look like an expression we might know? So at this point we're done, right? We know this, we know this. We can compute this double summation that gives you the gradient with respect to this. Does that look like anything? That operation? It's a convolution, yes. It's a very funny convolution where the roles of R's and A's have been swapped. To produce R comma C, you're summing over AB. To produce A comma B, you're summing over RC. It's a convolution. This thing is a N1 by N2 matrix. Right? The gradient with respect to Y is an N1 by N2 matrix. And X is also an N1 by N2 matrix. Right? And this is just doing the dot product after placing these matrices with an offset of A prime, B prime. But it's a convolution that you only care about the values up to k1, k2. Right? Because those are n1 by n2 matrices. Usually n1 by n2 is much bigger than k1 by k2. So if you place it everywhere and perform the full convolution, it's wasteful. Because I only care about its numbers only up to k1, k2. Does that make sense? So the forward pass is a convolution, and the backward pass is also a convolution. And this particular summation, another way of viewing it, is this is the outcome of parameter sharing, right? Each neuron here is sharing the same parameters as all the other neurons, right? Each output is the product of input times a filter, and that filter is shared between all the outputs. And that's why you have to collect the gradients coming from all of those outputs. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so once you have this, you basically have your gradients, you can take a step size. And the derivative with respect to x is something similar. It leads to a gradient map of the size of the input. It also looks like a funny convolution, and that you can read about in the notes. Okay, perfect. Any questions about this? Why is there summation in the first place? Because the loss is, that summation is coming because the loss is summation of all the y's? No, no, no. This summation in the first place is coming because we want to know how does the loss change with this, as I change this one particular uh, weight pixel. Right? There's a pixel here, A prime called B prime. That pixel affects all outputs, right? all Y pixels, it affects all of them. And each one of them affect the loss. So therefore you have to sum up its contribution, and this is like the chain rule thing we talked about. right? If you transform a vector into another vector, which ultimately leads to something else, you have to consider all intermediate variables. Like, I mean, I know that I have to consider everything, but why is summation? Why the operation is summation? Oh, uh, why is operation summation? That has to do with chain rule. Why is in chain rule? I mean, shouldn't it be that loss is... So there is summation. So loss is some function of y, and that function has to do something with summation. Hence, when I'm taking... No, it has nothing to do with the fact that this loss function factorizes or doesn't or that you know these things are additive into the loss function. It has to do with partial derivatives are considered by looking at summations of total derivatives with certain directions. Mm, okay. Yeah. That's why you have the summation. Okay. Any other questions about this? Alright. So that's what you're implementing. Similar expressions in the